Hello, habari, karibuni, welcome to Rooted Fellowship. My name is Naile Jineji and I have the privilege of navigating us today through our digital gathering. Rooted Fellowship is about three things. We are gospel-centered, disciple-making, and transcultural. We are also a giving church. If you would like to know more about these three things and the various ways which you can give to the Lord's work here at Rooted Fellowship, please visit our website. If you are in need, we encourage you to send us an email at community at rootedfellowship.com. We are now going to listen to the worship. to wait on you draw strength from you Lord rest in you Lord rest in you we will abide in you Lord hide in you Lord rest in you Lord rest in just to wait on you We are currently in the third season of Mark's Gospel. Pastor Jono will be preaching God's word today. 
We are now going to listen to the sermon. Dumelang, Liam Ogetswe, Momo Gai, Siena Mugela, Erute Digital. Welcome by Ons Erkak. Welcome to church. My name is John Otarope, and I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Rooted Fellowship under the leadership of our lead pastor, Onimo Katle. If you've been tracking with us for a while, you know that we are currently preaching through the gospel of Mark, Mark's gospel. And uh, we've been doing this over a number of series. We are now in series three, series three, um, and we are in part six of series three. I'm going to be uh, diving deeper into God's Word today from Mark 11 verses 27 all the way through to Mark 12 verses 17. And so if you have a Bible, I'd invite you to meet me there in Mark 11 27. I'm going to be reading from the Christian Standard Bible, uh, but if you don't have a Bible, uh, we will have these words up on the screen. And so with no further ado, let's get into uh, Mark chapter 11 verses 27 to chapter 12 verse 12. From the Christian Standard Bible. The authority of Jesus challenged. They came again to Jerusalem. As he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came and asked him, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do these things? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question, then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was John's baptism from heaven or of human origin? Answer me. They discussed it among themselves. If we say from heaven, he will say, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, they were afraid of the crowd because everyone thought that John truly was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. The parable of the vineyard owner. He began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug out a pit for a wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenant farmers and went away. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the farmers to collect some of the fruit of the vineyard from them. But they took him, beat him, and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent another servant to them, and they hit him on the head. And treated him shamefully. Then he sent another, and they killed that one. He also sent many others. Some they beat, and others they killed. He still had one to send, a beloved son. Finally, he sent, to them, sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenant farmers said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill the farmers and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and is wonderful in our eyes. They were looking for a way to arrest him, but feared the crowd because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. So they left him and went away. God and Caesar. Then they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to trap Jesus in his words. When they came, they said to him, Teacher, we know you are truthful and don't care what anyone thinks, nor do you show partiality, but teach the way of God truthfully. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. They brought a coin. Whose image and inscription is this? He asked him. Caesar's, they replied. Jesus told them, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. This is the word of the Lord, and so thanks be to God. Let's pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, we come before you today adoring you and thanking you for your word. This, this true eternal word. Lord God, we thank you and we praise you for Jesus. We praise you for sending Jesus into this world and for making a way for us to know you, to draw near to you, to hear from you, Lord God, to be guided by you. Holy Spirit, we ask now and we come before you humbly pleading, Holy Spirit, come and do a work in us, Lord God. We pray that as we 
uh, dive into this text, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal to us the things you would want to be revealed. I pray, Lord God, that you would use me to speak your truth. Pray, Lord God, for your wisdom in this time. We pray that we would draw closer to you, closer to one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Okay, so here in this text that we've just read from, Jesus is in the final week before he is crucified. A week that within the church has become known as Holy Week. And these events that we have just read about take place on Tuesday of Holy Week. Now, if you've been tracking with us for a while, you'd know that Mark's gospel has been moving at a fast, frantic pace. But now in this final week before Jesus' death and resurrection, the gospel writer begins to slow things down. And he zooms in as the final third or six chapters of this book describe Jesus' words and actions over the course of Holy Week. In this final third of the book, we see exactly how Jesus was the king we so desperately needed. The Sunday, two days before the events of the text I have just read from, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, where he was welcomed by the people of Jerusalem as their coming king. As he came into the city with a royal entry reserved for kings on what was known, uh, what is known as Palm Sunday. And Pastor One is going to preach on this in a couple of weeks' time when we celebrate Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter. So stick around as you won't want to miss that. But then Mark records Jesus asserting his kingly authority as he cleansed the temple the very next day, so on the Monday of Holy Week, which Pastor Sikle took us through last week. And now I have the privilege of diving deeper into the key things that Mark recorded Jesus saying and doing on the Tuesday of Holy Week a mere few days before his eventual crucifixion and death, where Jesus outrightly condemned the Jewish religious and political leaders, thus asserting his authority once again. In Mark 11, 27 to 12, 17, the passage I've just read, we see that once again in Mark's gospel, we have a number of interactions between Jesus and the religious and political authorities of the time. And these interactions are actually referred to as conflict accounts. And it's obvious as to why they are referred to as such. You see, family, Jesus is unquestionably asserting his authority as the beloved son of God as he comes into Jerusalem. He has asserted himself as king when he arrived in the territory of Jerusalem. We're going to see that in two weeks' time on Palm Sunday. He has asserted himself as king when he took it upon himself to cleanse the temple. We saw that last week. And now he's going to assert himself as king over the very leaders who have corrupted the Torah or God's law. This is King Jesus in his final week asserting himself over the territory, the temple, and finally those who are supposed to guard and not corrupt the Torah, being the five books of Moses which come at the very beginning of the Bible. And this formed the basis for all Jewish law and practice. Jesus is asserting himself over territory, temple, and Torah. And so, in fact, brothers and sisters, Mark has been emphasizing Jesus' identity and authority throughout his entire gospel account. And all throughout Mark's account, Jesus' authority is the one thing that leaves the most profound impression on his followers. Think about those who interacted with Jesus. Think about those who Jesus healed. Or even his disciples out on the boat when Jesus calmed the storm in Mark 4, when they asked, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Jesus' authority is the one thing that left the most profound impression on his followers. But we've also seen that Jesus' authority is the very thing that also led to his greatest opposition. And we see this even more so today as the authority of Jesus is directly challenged by the Jewish religious leaders yet again. And so brothers and sisters, with all of that in mind, as we dive deeper into our text for today, I'm asking you and me to consider some crucial questions. We need to consider these questions. Do you recognize Jesus as the beloved Son of God, sent by God the Father? Have you you received him as your Lord and Savior? And is he at the very center of your life 
as you seek to please God the Father above all other things. Do you recognize Jesus as the beloved Son of God sent by God the Father? Have you received him as your Lord and Savior? And is he at the very center of your life as you seek to please God the Father above all other things? Let's dive deeper into our text. Mark 11, verse 27, verse 27. They, so being Jesus and his disciples, came again to Jerusalem. As he was walking in the temple, remember now this is the day after he cleansed the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and elders came. So they're bringing in all the big names. This group was known as the Sanhedrin, and they were the Jewish high court or high council. Um, verse 28, and they, being the Sanhedrin, asked him, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do these things? In other words, who gave you the authority to cleanse the temple the way that Jesus had done the day before? But they were not just asking Jesus about the day before. Yes, they were asking Jesus who gave him the authority to drive money changers and animal sellers out of the temple. But they were also asking him who gave him the authority to teach? Who gave him the authority to do what he was doing? Because you see, the Jewish Sanhedrin or high court certainly had not given Jesus the authority to do these things. But you see, family, once again, these folks were trying to trap Jesus with this question, asking him a question to try and trap him yet again. And so if Jesus answers this question with a lie, that men had granted him the authority, he would lose his followers' trust and faith. Also, he's God, so he cannot lie. But if he answered the Sanhedrin with the truth, saying that his Father God had given him the authority, these leaders could accuse Jesus of blasphemy. Because under Jewish custom, this equated to claiming to be God. You see, fam, although prophets in the Old Testament spoke with God's authority and were not considered as blasphemers, Jesus was not recognized by the Jewish leaders to be a prophet. And thus, in their eyes, if Jesus claimed the authority, um, claimed God's authority, he was a blasphemer. And so according to Jewish law, if a man claimed to stand in the place of God, he insulted God and should be put to death, according to Leviticus 24. And so the trap is set. Verse 29. But Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was John's baptism from heaven or of human origin? Answer me, Jesus says. We've seen this before as well, right? Jesus answers those questioning him with a question. You see, family, if the Jewish high council said that John the Baptist's authority was from God, and John the Baptist pointed believers to Jesus, then they would have, it, have to acknowledge that Jesus' authority came from God as well. And this was not something that they were going to do. Because you see, John the Baptist had called these very same Jewish leaders to repent. Mark 1, 4 uh, and 7 to 8. Verse 4 of Mark 1. John came baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Mark in, uh, 1 verse 7 to 8. He proclaimed, one who is more powerful than I am is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then John the Baptist also preached that Jesus was the Messiah. We see this in John 1 verses 29 to 34. Where it says this, the next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he existed before me. I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water, so that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and rested on him. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see the Spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. And so that's why we see these religious leaders in verse 31 of our text today, the Jewish High Council, they begin to deliberate. Verse 31, they discussed it amongst themselves. If we say John the Baptist's authority came from heaven, he will say, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, well, then they were afraid of the crowd because everyone thought that John was truly a prophet. You see, this same Jewish high council had also not stood up for John the Baptist, and they had not attempted to get him released from prison because he was challenging them 
very much like Jesus was. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 7 to 10, um, this is what it says. It says, when, when he, being John the Baptist, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, therefore, verse 8, Matthew 3, verse 8, therefore produce fruit consistent with repentance. And don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. The axe is already at the roots of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And so verse 33 of our text today, Mark 11, verse 33. They answered Jesus, we don't know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. But family, was this really the case? Did these Jewish leaders really not know where Jesus' authority came from? They had seen him do so much. They had seen him fulfill so many prophecies, but their hearts were so hard towards Jesus that they just could not acknowledge who he was. And they refused to acknowledge where Jesus' authority came from. The Sanhedrin some 2,000 years ago are like many who live today. Their hearts are hard, and no matter how much God shows up in their lives, they refuse to repent and refuse to acknowledge Him. Paul writes in Romans 8 verse 7, The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. And so friend, as you're listening to this message today, are you refusing to acknowledge God's identity and authority in your own life? Has your heart hardened so much that even with Jesus standing in front of you, you still choose not to repent and acknowledge him as God's true son? If that is you, then Holy Spirit, I humbly ask that you would meet these folks right where they are today. Soften their hearts and may they see Jesus for all that he is, the one true son of God. Fellow believers, we need to pray for those whose hearts have been so hardened and we need to Hand them over to the Holy Spirit graciously as we ask Him to do a saving work in their lives. We need to be praying for these folks. But family of God, I also believe that we as believers in Jesus have something to learn from Him in this text as well, in this section. As Jesus meets these skeptics, He doesn't argue or shout or speak louder, but He listens and then He asks very well thought out questions. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, as you engage with your non-Christian friends and family, as you share the gospel with those whom you meet, as you go out and evangelize, as you go out and seek to be a blessing, as you go about your day and seek to share godly wisdom with those you come into contact with, do you take the time to listen, engage lovingly with these people, and ask great questions? Instead of trying to have all the answers, something that we don't have, instead of trying to have all the answers, perhaps we could follow Jesus' example and ask good questions. Ask good questions. Then, after this section of the text, after this back and forth with the Jewish high court, Jesus then seeks to make a severe point, crucial point, and he actually prophesies judgment as he begins to speak to those around him using this parable. Chapter 12, verse 1. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for a wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenant farmers and went away. Now, so we all know where we're going. The man or the planter in this parable is God the Father, and the vineyard is the Jewish nation of Israel. Now, notice the love and care of the planter. He plants a vineyard, puts a fence around it, dugs, digs a pit for a wine press, and built a watchtower. Now in this parable, Jesus is in fact referring to the prophet Isaiah, specifically Isaiah chapter 5 verses 1 through 7. And of course, this also would have been a text that the Jewish high council, who, who were still present, would have known all too well. Isaiah 5 verse 1 says, I will sing about the one I love, a song about my loved one's vineyard. 
the one I love had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. Now bear this in mind, in Jesus' time, the main reason for planting a vineyard was to produce wine, not profits from wine. A, a vineyard owner sought to produce good, fruitful wine for their own use. Keep that in mind. Verse 2 of Mark 12. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the farmers to collect some of the fruit of the vineyard from them. But they took him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent another servant to them, and they hit him on the other head, on the head and treated him shamefully. Then he sent another, and they killed that one. Notice the ex es escalation. He also sent many others. Some they beat, and others they killed. He still had one to send, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, they will respect my son. Now, now perhaps you got it already, but here Jesus is using this parable to describe the history of the Jewish nation of Israel. God the Father sent his servants, or prophets, to the nation of Israel, one by one, to look for the fruits of repentance and faith in and obedience to God the Father. And so then finally, he sends his own son. But the tenants, who are the Jewish religious leaders, shepherding the nation of Israel, or supposed to be shepherding them, they repeatedly rejected and even killed God's prophets. Verse 7. But those tenant farmers said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. At this point in the parable, the tenants erroneously assume that the planter of the vineyard or the owner was dead, and that his heir had come to claim his inheritance. And so if they killed his son, according to Jewish law, the vineyard would be theirs. Through this parable, Jesus is saying that Israel's religious leaders not only thwarted Israel's worshipping and glorifying of Yahweh, God the Father, but they even killed those trying to be faithful to him, even God's own son. And of course, Jesus is referring to himself here. Verse 8, so they seized him, killed him, killed the son of God, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? Now, you may have picked this up already. But at this point, the parable pivots and has become a prophecy about Jesus' death. Jesus, God's beloved son, came to the Jewish nation of Israel, but he was rejected by the religious leaders. And so they caused for him to be killed. But family, the owner of the vineyard was not dead. God the Father is not dead. Amen? And so carrying on with the second part of verse 9. He will come and kill the farmers and give the vineyard to others. He will come and kill the farmers and give the vineyard to others. The second part of this verse continues to be a prophecy and one which began being fulfilled after Jesus' crucifixion as God the Father gave the vineyard over to the Gentiles, to all nations, not just the nation of Israel. And indeed, this came to pass in the establishment of God the Father's diverse family of believers, or the New Testament church. However, this prophecy also found fulfillment in the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD, when the Romans completely destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, which Pastor Sikler also took us through last week. And then, in the next verses, Jesus prophesies about himself as the head of this New Testament church, as he quotes Psalm 118, 22 to 23, uh, Mark 12, verse 10 and 11, Jesus then says this, Haven't you read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and is wonderful in our eyes. Jesus refers to himself as the stone rejected by the builders. But even though he was rejected by most of the Jewish leaders, he became the capstone or cornerstone, or epicenter, focal point, and foundation of the new spiritual building known as the church. Peter even said of Jesus in Acts 4, verse 11 to 12, when he addressed these same Jewish religious leaders, this Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. To really drive home the point, if we read this parable in Matthew's gospel, right after Jesus quotes Psalm 118, Matthew records Jesus as going on to say this, verse 43, Matthew. Let's 
20, 21. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will shatter him. Sisters and brothers, Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God no longer belongs to the fleshly descendants of Abraham by virtue of their Jewish birth, but rather it is now being extended to all of the spiritual descendants of Abraham who join in this inheritance by virtue of their faith in, faith in Jesus alone. Their faith in Jesus alone. When the nation of Israel rejected Jesus, the gospel of salvation was then given to all who would put their faith and trust in him. John 3.16 says, For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Family, Jesus' identity, his authority, his life, and his teachings are now the church's foundation. Jesus' identity, his authority, his life, and his teachings. Jesus is now the church's foundation. In Jesus' time, a cornerstone was used as the base to make sure all the other stones of the building were straight and level. A cornerstone was used as a base to make sure all the other stones of the building were straight and level. We need to ask ourselves corporately as a church, Rooted Fellowship, what has been our response to the cornerstone? Families listening and watching, what has been our response to the cornerstone? As individuals watching, listening, what has been our response to the cornerstone? Brother and sister, who or what is your cornerstone? Who or what is your cornerstone? We need to check ourselves. Is Jesus truly the cornerstone that aligns all the other areas of our individual lives? Is Jesus truly the cornerstone that aligns all the other areas of our family's lives? Is Jesus truly the cornerstone that aligns all the other areas within Rooted Fellowship? Or are we running around focusing on a whole host of other things whilst the buildings of our individual lives are falling apart? Whilst our family houses are eroding and our churches are crumbling. Family, is Jesus an add-on after the fact? Or is he rightfully at the center of everything? Or have we rejected him? Like the tenants in the parable. Like Israel's religious leaders who caused for him to be put to death. Perhaps you're not a Christian and you are listening or watching today. Friend, are you ambivalent towards Jesus? You're not against him, but you're not for him either. Or perhaps you have rejected this Jesus and waged war against him and those who follow him. Perhaps you mock him and ridicule him and his followers. Jesus is willing to forgive and receive you and his sacrifice covers all. But are you willing to repent and to turn away from your sins and the things of this world? to receive him as your Lord and Savior and put your trust in him and let him take the rightful place at the very center of your life. It is my prayer that you would say yes to Jesus today. Then the second section of our text ends with verse 12. They, being the Sanhedrin, were looking for a way to arrest him, but feared the crowd because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. So they left him and went away. The Jewish religious leaders knew that Jesus had spoken this parable against them. And so their anger burned towards Jesus. And so they continued to look for a way to arrest him. Which, of course, they eventually did. Nearly a few days later. And then we come to our final section of the text for today. God and Caesar, verse 13. God and Caesar, verse 13. Then they, so being the same Sanhedrin, they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to Jesus to trap him in his words. You'd be forgiven for thinking, we've seen this movie before. Only now we have the Pharisees and the Herodians teaming up. Now these two groups were not, were not allies. They weren't allies. They, were, they wanted different things, but they did have a common enemy in Jesus. Remember, the Pharisees were primarily a religious group seeking outward religious ritualistic purity. And Jesus had already exposed their hypocrisy a number of times. 
And the Herodians were Jewish uh, political groups supporting Herod's partnership with Rome. And they feared that Jesus would cause more political instability in Judea. And so both groups wanted to be rid of Jesus and therefore tried to trap Jesus. Verse 14, when they came, they said to him, Teacher, we know you are truthful and don't care what anyone thinks, nor do you show partiality, but, but teach the way of God truthfully. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? So here we have these two groups using verbal flattery. They're flattering Jesus to try and trick him. At that time, under Roman rule, anyone who didn't pay taxes faced harsh penalties. And the Jews in Judea hated paying these taxes because this money was, was used to support the Roman oppressors and it represented their subjection. A large portion of these taxes also went to the maintenance of the Roman pagan temples and lavish lifestyles of the Romans living in Judea. And so by asking this question, the Pharisees and the Herodians feel that they've backed Jesus into a corner. They've backed Jesus into a corner. If he answered that it was right to pay taxes, Jesus would be supporting Rome. And this would undoubtedly turn people against Jesus. But if he answered that it was not right to pay these taxes, accusations of treason and rebellion could then be brought against Jesus. So they think they've backed Jesus into a corner, but he is the cornerstone. And look what the cornerstone replies with. And so verse 15, but knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius, which was a Roman coin. Uh, to look at. Bring me a denarius to look at. They brought a coin. Whose image and inscription is this? He asked them. Caesar's, they replied. Jesus told them, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. Now at this time, anything that had a person's stamp or inscription on it belonged to that person. And so Jesus shrewdly answered that uh, as the Roman coin had Caesar's image on it, it therefore belonged to Caesar. But in the same way, it can be said that all people, all people were created in God's image, and therefore we belong to God. And so our taxes belong to the government, but we ourselves, our lives belong to God. And so Jesus, in a sense, takes this opportunity to show his followers that we have a dual citizenship. We have a dual citizenship. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2 verse 17, Honor everyone, love the brothers and sisters, fear God, honor the emperor. Family, our citizenship on this earth requires that we honorably compensate the authorities for the utilities that we receive as we form part of a society. But family, our citizenship in the kingdom of heaven requires that we pledge to God our faith and trust in him and his ways. As Jesus' followers, whilst here on earth, we have legitimate obligations to both God and the governmental authorities. But family, do not miss it. We have to keep our priorities in check. We have to keep our obligations in check. If ever the two authorities conflict, then our duty to God always must come before our duty to the government. Only if the government forces us to disobey God's law. Only if the government forces us to disobey God's law must we oppose the government in that particular matter. Luke writes in Acts 4, 18 to 20. So they, once again being the Jewish religious leaders, called for them, Peter and John, Jesus' close followers, and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Acts 4, 19. Peter and John answered them, Whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Family, where there is murder, abuse, injustice, racism, hatred, oppression, persecution, partiality, theft, corruption, etc., etc., our duty to God and glorifying Him by calling out these injustices must come first. Living in light of the gospel must be our first priority. Living in light of the gospel must be our first priority. Jesus needs to be our cornerstone. When we choose to honor and glorify man, specifically those in authority, above honoring the creator and sustainer of the universe, we promote injustice and brokenness. With this choice comes an unwillingness and a reluctance to name and condemn injustice. With this choice comes a reluctance and then an unwillingness to name and condemn injustice. History has shown us this to be true. 
family of God, we need to ask ourselves how apartheid in South Africa, the genocide in Rwanda, and the Holocaust in Germany happened in countries where the overwhelming belief system professed was Christian. Family, it is my prayer that as we reflect on these unthinkable injustices, that these would again remind us of the danger of forgetting who it is that we serve, whose authority we fear the most. As Peter said, we need to fear God and honor the government. We need to fear God and honor the government, not seek to honor the government above God himself. And so family of God, I ask us once again today, is Jesus at the very center of your life? Is he your cornerstone? And do you seek to serve God the Father above all other things, no matter what? Is Jesus at the very center of your life? Is he your cornerstone? And do you seek to serve God the Father above all other things, no matter what the cost? And then to the non-believers tuning in, or perhaps you're one of the people sitting on the fence with this whole church thing. Friend, do you recognize Jesus as beloved Son of God, sent by God the Father? Have you received Him as your Lord and Savior? Family, I pray that as we reflect on Jesus' authority in our hearts today, that His Holy Spirit would reveal to us exactly where we stand with God, and that many who hear God's message today would be drawn into a relationship with Him, or perhaps a deeper relationship with Him, and that we would grow even closer together as the family of God here at Rooted Fellowship. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you adoring you as the God, the creator and sustainer of all things. You are our Father. Lord God, we, we come before you acknowledging and thanking you for sending Jesus. Lord God, we thank you for sending your son Jesus into this world. We thank you that he came with your authority. And Lord God, that he lived a life that we should have lived, that he died the death that we should have died. And Lord God, that in rising again, he made a way for us to know you and relationship and fellowship with you. We praise you for your gospel, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you made a way. We thank you that you were the Savior, the beloved Son of God, the King that we so desperately needed. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would come and move now. Come and move, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word, Lord God. We pray that the things of, of this word would, would speak truth into our lives. That all those who, have, who are hearing this message would take stock of their lives, Lord God, would reflect on what you are saying to them, what you've showed them. And Lord God, we thank you that you are, you are there. You are there in our midst. We need only confess, repent, and put our faith and trust in you, Jesus. We thank you that you are the, the glorious King. We thank you and praise you that you are coming back. You are coming back with all the authority. And so Lord God, we pray for your courage and for your steadfastness as we go out into this week. We pray, Lord God, that we would fear you above all other things, that we would put you at the center, no matter what the cost, and that we know that we have a beloved Son of God as a Savior, no matter what the cost. We pray this all in Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen and amen. We've come to the end of our digital gathering. We pray you have been encouraged, challenged, and comforted. Please don't forget to like, subscribe to our channel, and hit the notification bell. We normally end our gathering with a benediction or a good word. Today's benediction comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with all of you. Amen. Have a blessed week.